Sam Amick, the athletic, uh, said uh, LeBron James would uh, be, quote, very enthused at the possibility of the Lakers hiring Mark Jackson as head coach. I did reach out to Mark Jackson about uh, 15 minutes ago, and I said, Lakers, question mark? And then Mark said, uh, my phone hasn't been ringing. And that was it. A non-denial denial. Sam Amick, the uh, athletic reporter, joining us on the program. Uh, explain your conversation, uh, if you can. Uh, when did you have one with LeBron, and uh, what came out of that? Good morning, Dan. Always great to be with you. Um, so he had his exit interview with the media in L.A. yesterday, 9 a.m. Uh, he wanted to get it out of the way early, which I found fascinating. Everybody else went in the afternoon. LeBron had regular life to get back to, so he jumped on Zoom. Uh, I, I was not there in person, so I jumped on and, and asked him specifically about the messiness of the Vogel firing and whether or not the lack of professionalism bothered him at all. So that was the, uh, that was the dialogue with him yesterday. And then like you said on, on the intro here, uh, you know, a lot more information in the column itself. Okay. But what did he say about the professionalism of the, uh, the organization, how they, <laughs> they handled uh, Frank Vogel? I mean, like I wrote, so it's like to me and in, in the, in the short version was, translated in my mind as I just work here. You know what I mean? Which is obviously not the case, but he kind of had a, a, a vibe about him of, he went through this whole thing. It's just like, Sam, you know, I knew uh, when I was talking to you all this morning, so I got up extra early so I could take my daughter to school, dropped her off at school, came down and he went through this whole thing about his day. And he, and he said, I was three minutes late to talk to you guys. I apologize. You know, he was talking to his, his media advisor, Adam Mendelson on the side before jumping on zoom. And, uh, and so at the end of it, he just essentially said, you can't control, um, how, you know, people feel about the way you, you handle your business. It kind of, it is what it is essentially. And it wasn't, to me, it wasn't dismissive of Frank at all. It was just another example of a LeBron kind of looking around in Lakerland and saying, I'm not going to be held accountable for all the, the weirdness that occasionally happens around here. What did Frank Vogel do or not do that cost him the, his job? I mean, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, the obvious is just not win ball games. I think it's as simple as that. And then, cause he didn't, in my opinion, if you, you know, you could argue that he, 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 you know, you hear the adage of just, you, you lost your players. I don't think it's that simple because there was not acrimony between Frank and his players other than, in my opinion, Russell Westbrook. Um, you know, and I think that, that Frank tried his best to make the Westbrook situation work, but you know, this was a disastrous season for a team that, you know, that Vegas had winning the whole thing, I believe going into the season. So um, it's just that. And, and really, I think it's also a lack of connectivity uh, between Frank and the front office that I would put on the front office that, you know, Rob Palenka is, it's an interesting time to be Rob because when he won the championship and, and after the magic Johnson experience, it was obviously all over the headlines. Like it winning it all masked a lot of the kind of internal dysfunction that I think was there the entire time. Um, and now we are seeing it kind of rear its head again. So to your question about Frank, I just think it's, it's the accountability question. They lost ball games. You're not going to fire LeBron and say, "Hey, you wanted Russ, so you're out of here." That doesn't happen. Um, and then Rob is kind of, you know, in my opinion, mostly wiping his hands of this, even though he built the roster. Uh, and so Frank ends up being the fall guy. Yeah, I just wonder about this: the the uh, disconnect with Russell Westbrook and Frank Vogel. That how was Frank supposed to use Russell Westbrook? that he didn't use him in that way. I mean, he did play the most minutes, and he did play 78 games, so Russ was on yeah. the floor more than anybody else. He was. Uh, to me, it's just it's a painful um, process when elite, hall, you know, future Hall of Fame players have to come to grips with the fact that they're just in a different stage. And, you know, there's been, I think, apt comparisons made between Russ and Allen Iverson, um, you know, hopefully he has a, a kind of a, a better exit than Allen did when, you know, he's in Memphis and Detroit. 
Um, but that's where Russ is, is this question of like, he, I, I, he talked a lot about sacrifice yesterday and I do understand that he made some with this team, but I think deep down, he still gets up in the morning feeling like he can be Russell Westbrook, the guy who averaged triple double, however many times and former MVP. And so, you know, he's not ready to let that go. Um, and more importantly, even if he is, that's what's always made him great. And we have not seen some kind of watered down version of his, his game where you see an evolution to where he can be an impact player off the ball defensively, you know, doing the little things that, that profile has never existed. And yeah. so, uh, you know, I, I just think if you're Frank, you're, you're sitting there shaking your head, like, what am I supposed to do here? Yeah, because you have a player who still thinks he's Russell Westbrook of seven years ago, and you can't change him at 34. He still can't shoot. Um, he has it, – it's almost like his body and his mind work really fast, but they don't always work in unison. And that, that he – and I love the effort that he gives. It's just sometimes it's the effort that gets him in trouble. And I don't know if you're going to – I'm going to get LeBron at, at uh, season 20. I get Westbrook. I guess I get Anthony Davis. And then what else am I getting? Is this an attractive job? Right. Absolutely. Uh, and you're not alone, by the way, with your analysis of his mind and body, you know, just kind of having a bit of a, a, a sink problem there, if you will. It's, you know, we, we saw that moment courtside in the regular season when Shaq uh, kind of chirped at him a little bit to tell him to slow down. Um, there's some people with the Lakers who have tried to, to find solutions here with, with that kind of mentality of, you know, how do we get the best out of Russ? And, and I'm dying to see going forward. I mean, I know everybody assumes he's going to get traded. I don't know if it's going to be as easy as people think. So, you know, for all I know, I mean, maybe they end up having to run it back and, and, and talk him into being a six man. I mean, it's unlikely, but um, it, it was an uncomfortable year. And on a human level, at times I did feel bad for Russ because we can all at least appreciate the idea that he grew up in this city, comes back, thinks it's going to be, you know, the stuff of childhood dreams. And, and, and he becomes kind of the poster boy for one of the, the most infamous teams probably in league history. How did the name Mark Jackson come up with your conversation with LeBron? No, that was, uh, to, you know, and you know how our jobs are. That was reporting, um, that I will just say, you know, was confidently gleaned that, that he would give a big thumbs up to Mark. That was not part of the Zoom conversation. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That that was that was uh, you know, that was relayed to me. I will say though, it's it's you know, this the politics of this league, oh, it never ceased to amaze me. It's <laughs> like he the, there is a, a an understandable uh desire from, you know, his side and his camp. To, you know, they're very sensitive to the idea that, that that he's pulling the strings with the Lakers. And I think they make some really good points. So, like, on the Mark Jackson front, I tried to write it as accurately and delicately as possible. He just would – he would give a big thumbs up if they hired Mark Jackson. That's not me saying he's internally pushing for Mark and saying Mark Jackson or else because LeBron knows that, that you know, the second that he does that, yep. it becomes a story. And, and we all know that he did push for the Westbrook trade. And now that's partly on his unofficial kind of GM resume. So it's, it's Mark is a guy, I mean, Mark's got a ton of superstar support in this league. And so the longer he doesn't have a head coaching job, I think this kind of noise will only get louder. Um, but in terms of LeBron and AD and the makeup of this locker room, the way it was relayed to me, is that they, they would react well to somebody like Mark who could command the room and, you know, come in with the respect of the stars and role players alike. And that, uh, that LeBron's not alone. There's quite a few guys that think that would be a good, excuse me, a good fit. Yeah, but it, it, I've always got this feeling, and I'm friends with Mark, and, uh, you know, we've had conversations of why he's not getting another job. It feels like the players are all in. It doesn't feel like the front office is all in with Mark Jackson. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, I would. Um, to that point, I found it somewhat fascinating. You know, I, I wrote the story. Our, our place published it this morning, and they found a picture of Mark Jackson talking to Rob Palenka. 
And, and that picture in and of itself made me wonder, like, I don't know the exact state of that relationship. That is the sort of thing, you know, that would matter. Um, the, the backstory, though, as you know, is one that is, you know, it's probably uh, needs more time to be analyzed. But, I mean, his, his Warriors exit was, was messy. Um, you know, I think that Joe Lacob and that group um, were frustrated with him at that time to a point where, you know, parts of that experience stuck with him as he left in terms of his reputation. Um, and, and there's other stuff, too. I mean, you know, there's you know, the Jason Collins or Jaron Collins comments, rather, that, that uh, you know, are tough to get away from in today's climate. Uh, and I think, like, I mean, everybody's made mistakes. So every candidate these days is going to have stuff to work through uh, with the organization that they're possibly going to work with. And I will say, though, this is the first time for me in a while where you're starting to feel like the groundswell with Mark might tip a bit to where you navigate those waters and, and, and eventually see him on a sideline again. Well, those pe- players better be ready because Mark is a hard-nosed guy, a no-nonsense oh, yeah. guy. He, I don't know if he's a player's coach, but he, he, demands, he demands, you know, accountability. I'll say this much quickly, though, Dan, on that front. Um, one of the driving forces, I think, in terms of his reputation being in good shape with players now is that publicly, privately, if, if you go at a Steph Curry, a Draymond Green, a Clay Thompson, guys that he was obviously sharing the room with for years, they continue to, to speak highly of the, the impact he had on them and the way that he kind of set the tone for what they accomplished once he was gone. So um, that – kind of stuff matters a great deal and uh and, and again there's a lot of support from mark sam great job it's great to talk to you again thanks for joining us on short notice you got it thank you dan all right sam amick the uh senior nba writer for the athletic